Hi there, let's take a look at the end of unit test for function studies. Um, I'm specifically going to have a look at the calculator section. First thing I'd like to point out is that the calculator section was out of 30 marks, not 29. So your mark was accordingly derived. And now let's have a look at uh, each question turn by turn. Uh, the first question was question six with questions one to five in the non-calculator section. Generally speaking, this question was answered well with students being able to get the domain and range basically right. Often problems were around the use of round brackets, which remember, if you've got an open circle, it means that number is not included. Square bracket means it was included. Um, or another problem that uh, students sometimes had was when they had a look at the range, they saw that it went from 0.7 to negative 2 and wrote 0.7 to negative 2 um, but we always go from least to greatest number so don't go left to right all the time we go left to right for domain and down to up for the range you can see that um, if you did get it in the wrong order there was no mark for that um, and if you used the incorrect boundary you got uh, pinged half a mark each time you did that okay let's have a look at question two or question seven, I suppose I should say. I think this is one of those questions that um, you, if you got right, then it was fairly easy to get four marks. I think, you know, if you knew what you're doing, you got four marks. If you didn't know what you're doing, it was hard to get any. Um, you can see the breakdown of marks here. Just a quick um, rearrangement here for a mark using your um, basic log rule or something to get this kind of form was worth a couple of marks and then. Um, doing a bit more manipulation got you the final mark, as long as you ended up with basically this. Obviously, no mark was given for this because, you know, you were, were given that. So you had to show all the working out leading, working out leading up to that. Um, some of you might have received a, um, a BOD somewhere on this page. If, you, if I wrote BOD on yours, it means that um, I was giving you the benefit of the doubt for a um, something that you might not have written quite correctly but i said ah, oh, i think they knew what they were talking about so bod the other one you might see uh, somewhere in the test is um ecf which is error carried forward so if you made an error for example in here somewhere and then you correctly applied that um, error um, in other parts you'd get an ecf mark um, potentially four marks as long as you didn't make the um the resultant um, steps um, too easy um, so yes, yeah, students tended to do pretty well on that. Um, where I couldn't give marks was things like um, students tried to use log base, um, sorry, convert it here uh, before, sorry, convert it here before they um, took away the one and then they magically t um, subtracted one after that. So they had e to the x equals um, three minus seven plus one or something like that. And so it became a little bit mathematical at that point. So you know, you need to get the log all by itself first, and then you can rearrange it to um, uh, to get the e to the x notation and go from there. Um, in part B here, I'll just zoom it up a little bit so you can see it. There were two correct ways you could write this, possibly others as well. But basically, if you started off with a dilation, then the um, translation to one unit to the right was often uh, written correctly. You, you observe this. Um, but then there's a translation of seven thirds units up. Um, so um, some students, uh, many who got that wrong said there was a translation of seven units up, which is not true because we have to, if we multiply this out, we can see that um, that would be a seven thirds translation up as written here. However, you can get away with seven units up as long as you wrote the translations first. So just to show you what I mean, uh, number one, translating once to the right. Number two, translating seven units up. So you've gone up seven units. And then the dilation, which is applied to the whole of this, would then bring that seven down to seven thirds again. So this would absolutely work as well. Um, other slight combinations would work. Um, so you've got one mark for each and one mark for uh, getting it in the correct order. Okay, part C was worth four marks. Now, when you see something with four marks, it's almost guaranteed that you'll be getting some marks for some kind of working out. In this instance, um, the working out probably was 
working out the y-intercept. Um, but ultimately, as long as there was some working out somewhere that was reasonably um, worthwhile, then you would have received a, a mark for some of that working out. Then you would have got a mark for the y-intercept. Then you would have got another mark for writing in the asymptote. Um, and you would have got a, another mark for getting the shape just about right. Now, I should point out that um, the asymptote should be labelled as an equation, y equals 7 over 3. Um, if you just wrote 7 over 3 without the y equals, you would have lost a mark. If you just wrote a dotted line without anything there at all, you would have got no marks for that, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, what else? I'm just having a look at my notes. Oh, just a point about um, the sketches that you draw. Um, you need to do one of two things or both. When you draw the line itself, you should go from the very edge of the Cartesian plane or the axis all the way to the other edge of the drawn in axis. So you should go from here to here in this instance and or you should put arrows on the end of your lines. If you put arrows on the end of your lines, it's okay if you start here and end here because the arrows say, yes, it does go on forever. Um, but without arrows, you must go from edge to edge um, for it to be properly drawn. Okay, what else did I need to say about this? Um, typically, technically speaking, um, it's always good to include an extra point somewhere to give a better sense of scale. Now, often there's enough information on your graph already to give that scale as well. Um, but sometimes, depending on what's going on, it might not be. Now, you didn't lose any marks for not putting an extra point in, but I would suggest that you do get in the habit of drawing one extra point because um, that will guarantee that you've shown a good scale. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Question eight did provide some issues of difficulty, so I thought I'd take some time to explore this in a little bit more detail. So you've been given three functions and you're asked to state with justification whether the function f of f of x exists. Probably the easiest way to do it would be to do your domain range uh, boxing like this. It's pretty repetitive, I guess, if it's the same thing, but nevertheless, it does show quite clearly that each of the domains and ranges here are equal to each other. Now, we know f of f of x um, basically means that uh, it's a composite function. Um, and so we can see that um, here I've got rand f equals dom f um, equal is uh, technically equivalent to, um, well, equal works for subset as well. So if two sets are equal, like the range of f and the domain of f, um, if two sets are equal, then effectively you can say one set is a subset of the other, and it just so happens that that set is also the subset of that. So two equivalent sets um, are also subsets of each other. So if you wrote the range of f is a subset of the domain of f, that would be appropriate, they are the same. Um, I wanted to see range of f is a subset or equal to the domain of f specifically because that's our understanding of when composite functions exist, when the range of the um, inside function is a subset of the outside function. Okay, um, a number of people wrote things which weren't sufficient. Some people tried to find f of f of x. Um, that's not sufficient for, for showing that it exists. Um, because the resultant function might be um, predicated on um, a range that doesn't um, fit into the domain. Um, it's not sufficient to say that it is one-to-one. -one. You can have one-to-one -one functions that are not um, composite functions. And I've got a quick example here to show you. So here's what f of x looks like. Here's what g of x looks like. And here's what h of x looks like. Now, in the case of f of f of x, it does work. It just so happens that f of x happens to be self-invertible, which means if we take f of f of x, we get a straight line y equals x. It just so happens. But x can't equal negative 1. So there would be actually a gap at x equals negative 1 on this graph. Um, 
but here's a one-to-one -one composite function that doesn't exist, where the composite doesn't exist, sorry. So here's z of x equals the negative square root of x. So you get that sort of reflection across here. And if I do z of z of x, you don't see anything at all, right? It's, it's blank because z of z of x doesn't work because it's going to output negative numbers. And then when a negative number is input back into z of x, it's not going to, you know, you can't take the square root of a negative number and get a real result. So it doesn't work as a composite function, even though it's one to one. Okay, so that's basically the approach to that one. Part B, work out the composite function hg of x. Now, a number of people then proved that it existed. No need to do that. It doesn't ask for you to do it. It even gives it to you as a fact, so you don't have to. So there's no point actually proving that it exists. It doesn't help you, unless it said prove it. This was missed quite a lot by, by people. Find it. A lot of people gave the domain and range and did it nicely, but they didn't find it. So you actually had to do this bit here where you found it. And um, a number of people did something a bit wrong at this point. So they found it fine. We can see that g of x, which is the square root of uh, 2x minus 3, was put in as its argument. And then people did that fine and got this nice little linear function 2x minus 4. And we can see it over here. There we go, 2x minus 4. But look, it starts there and doesn't go on forever, even though we know the function is 2x minus 4. And in fact, a lot of people said, oh, well, I can see the resultant function is just 2x minus 4, a linear function. And they concluded that domain is all real numbers and that range is all real numbers. But the problem with that, of course, is that because the input is g of x here, then we need to consider the domain of g of x as being the input of the composite function. So we look at root 2x minus 3 and say, well, what would the domain of that be? And in a test situation, if you weren't really too sure, you could graph it to work that out, I suppose. But really, all we're saying is look under the square root sign. What is it? What kind of values would not work? Um, what, what, kind of values, what kind of values of x would give us um, the square root of a negative number? Because we know that's basically all that won't work is the square root of a negative number. And so if I solve in here 2x minus 3, I would get um, 3 over 2 uh, as the value for x. So 3 over 2 for x would give me the square root of 0, which is fine. Anything before 3 over 2 would, be in, uh, would give us the square root of a negative number. So the domain becomes 3 over 2 to infinity. Um, and the range is really the same range as... Um, is the same range as h of x. So if you, again, graph it on your GDC or do a little drawing off to the side if you want to, you can just go, what's x squared minus 1? Well, that's just going to be something like this. So you do a really quick draw, drawing like that. Just really rough, just so you can get a sense of, okay, it's going to go from minus 1 to infinity, and there's the range there. Okay, so you, you feel free to do that. Okay, so it looks like a linear function, but it does not have a real domain, um, all real number domain and all real number range. The function g of h of x does not exist. So again, you don't have to prove that it doesn't exist. Um, find and state a suitable um, restriction on h of x. We, as we use our usual h star notation or h asterisk notation. So you can see here I um, started with doing a... Um, uh, domain range box and successful students were well successful students did the whole lot but um, the more successful students tended to do this domain range box and then this is the bit that they needed to do next um, which was to consider the boundary of the um, outside function which is g and say well I know that I need to have 3 over 2 as the minimum value coming into the function. So then you look at the inside function and you go, well, the inside function is x squared minus 1. So what value of x, because that'll tell me about the domain, what value of x will give me the um, that minimum value of 3 on 2? So you do that and you get um, x squared equals 5 on 2 and then you get x equals, and then this is where a few people got went wrong. Doesn't matter, I've 
change the, the shape of it. But if you'd written the square root of 5 on 2, that's absolutely fine. So x equals the square root of 5 on 2. However, when you square root an x, then you need to consider the positive and negative um, result of that. So the answer is five, plus or minus root 5 on 2. I've just rationalized the denominator to make it plus or minus root 10 on 2. Okay, so you needed to do that. That would have got you a mark there out of the three. Now, you then need to consider what that boundary means. So I'll just use the root 5 on 2 rather than this form. Um, if I had this, the positive square root 5 on 2, the point is that if I square the square, if I square the square root of root 5 on 2, I'm going to get um, 5 on 2 and then subtract 1 to get 3 on 2. But if I square negative 5 on 2, then I'm going to get the same result as well. That's why we need to consider plus or minus. But then if you think about it, anything beyond um, root 5 on 2 would also work because it's just going to be even bigger number squared minus 1 is going to be bigger than 3 on 2. And so that's fine because that works for the rest of the domain. But then again, if I take the negative root 5 on 2 and square that, that also becomes positive. Subtract 1, it'll be bigger than 3 on 2. So then our domain becomes something rather complicated. It becomes from minus infinity to minus root 5 on uh, 2, joined with positive root 10 on 2 or, or, or root 5 on 2, um, root all 5 on 2 to infinity. And the output would be 3 over 2 to, to infinity, which is the, um, the uh, domain of um, G. Okay, so H star range would be what we need for the domain of G. So there we go. Or in, um, in our other notation, we can say X is all real numbers as long as X is less than negative um, uh, root 10 on 2 or, or the square root of um, 5 on 2 um, or x has to be greater than so you just got to go that or that there's an, some people did um, a bunch of other notations um, but you really can't use those um, use different notations um, like um, they kind of went x is greater than negative root 10 on 2 or root 5 on 2 whatever I'm just using my whiteboard my, my mouse here so it's not very good and then they went like that as well kind of thing so they used some weird notations which um, uh, would have lost you half a mark I think because I could see what you're doing but it wasn't um, wasn't quite right okay so that was probably a really good a standard question I think because it really made you think about what does this mean in order to get your domain um, looking right so well done if you got full marks for that one because it was pretty tricky. But long story short, you need to consider when you work out these boundary values or whatever, you then need to consider the impact of these boundary values um, in order to uh, work out the problem properly. Um, I'm just going to flick over here. Yeah, so that's what that's what that looks like for g of h of x. So it, it kind of makes sense if you have a look at the function h of x introduces a square, g of x is a um, square root function, so we end up doing a, a kind of truncated truncus kind of thing as a result. Okay, so that's basically that. Question 9, uh, final question. Um, generally speaking, this was done well. Some people chose to take the left-hand side, uh, and that was absolutely fine as well. So... Um, they their suitable domain restriction was from negative infinity to neg uh, to two, that's fine. Either would work and would have got you the full mark. However, if you had chosen negative two, sorry, negative infinity to two, um, the rest of this becomes more tricky as a result. So generally speaking, I would advise you take the right hand side. Um, you're, you're keeping things as positive as possible then, and there tends to be fewer things that trip you up. That's some general advice. Your mileage varies depending on the question. Um, okay, so sketching the restricted function and its inverse on one set of axes below. Um, generally speaking, again, 
there were issues in how we break up that four mark. So you can see that you got a, a mark effectively for drawing the um, the endpoints, 2 comma 1, 1 comma 2. Uh, you get a mark for the shape and you need to show some working out. In generally speaking, students um, students who showed working out did so by working out the inverse function to whatever degree of um, success they did that. You would have got a mark for that, maybe half a mark. Took half a mark off if you didn't conclude that f of inverse of x um, uh, notation. Um, but uh, generally speaking, students received um, most, uh, mostly received full marks for, um, for inverse, but some working out needed to be shown. Technically, it didn't say you had to work out the inverse. So technically, um, if you didn't um, show the inverse and um, but showed some other working out, um, I may have marked it down by a mark as a result. We had a quick, we had a close look at this um, after um, I'd finished marking this to see if it affected anyone's uh, results if I hadn't given them that mark and the answer was not really so we didn't change that mark it doesn't really affect anything but if you want to argue your case with your teacher please feel free to um, you lost half a mark if you didn't label your each of your functions here so one has to be called f and the other one has to be called f inverse or f to the minus one um, that's a really important part of of drawing the graph um, and one thing I thought I might show you at this point as well just for the sake of it is how to um, is how to find your the inverse function on your calculator so I'm going to pause the video for a moment while I set that up and then we shall have a look at Okay, I shall flip back to this first of all and just remind you that the function is um, y equals x minus 2 all squared plus 1. And we know that to work out the inverse function, we just swap the input and outputs. So where there's an x, we put a y, and where there's a y, we put an x. So if we have a look at this in our calculator, what we do is we use our solve function, which you can find in the menu algebra um, options. And I'm going to type in the equation, but I'm going to type it in with the x and y swapped around. So I'm going to go x is equal to y minus 2 all squared. So it used to be y equals x minus 2 all squared. Now I've got y minus 2 all squared plus 1. And instead of going comma x like we normally do, we're going to go comma y. And you can see that the result is the inverse function. So f, in, f, of my, f minus 1 of x is either... 2 minus the square root of x minus 1 or the square root of x minus 1 plus 2. Now you can see the difference between these two is this has a negative outside the square root of x minus 1 and this is positive here. So what you need to do is you need to choose which one works for the domain that you chose in part A. So for most people they are going to be choosing this because they said from 2 to infinity. But if you chose negative two, uh, sorry, negative infinity to two, then you'd have to choose this option. And so if you're working in your working out, you in landed with this instead of this. When you chose the left hand side, negative infinity to two, you'd lose half a mark for that for not choosing the right function. The working out's not quite right. Okay, the other thing I should point out as well is this. This is the original function, f of x equals x minus 2 all squared. If I choose a, a, domain, a domain restriction to the right, then I'm picking that bit there in blue. So I'll turn that off. And so the inverse looks like that. And we can see that's um, 2 comma 1 and 1 comma 2. And it is symmetrical about y equals x. So that's all good. But I want to show you what happens if you choose the other one, um, because this is the shape that you'd be looking for if you um, if you had picked the left hand side. Um, the left hand side looks like this. So this is negative infinity to two. And then when you inverted it, you would have to have done that, and is going through y equals x as well. So that's what you need to be careful of is that. If you choose a particular domain restriction, your 
graphs must reflect that domain restriction. Otherwise, you won't get the right marks for the um, for getting the shape right because you haven't. This is also an example of where the points of intersection are, are not always on y equals x. 99% of the time, they are on y equals x. But occasionally, like this one, the circumstances are such that there are other points of intersection that are not on y equals x. This one there and this one there. But there will, will be points of intersection. If they exist, there will be points of intersection on y equals x as well. Keep that in, in mind when we look at the next question. And the final one, which is part C, calculate the point of intersection between the two graphs. Now, many, 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 many of you went x minus y or squared plus 1 is equal to, and then, um, I don't have it written on this sheet, but, and then wrote the, um, the f inverse on the other side, which was um, x, the square root of x minus 1 plus 2. So many of you wrote that, and in a calculator section, it actually doesn't matter. Um, you put it into your calculator, and you'll get some values out, and you need to pick the value which suits the domain. In this case, x equals 3.618. If you'd chosen the negative um, side, then there would have been three values that would have been appropriate, and all three would need to be um, written down. It is an edge case, though, doing it that way. So just a reminder then, particularly if this was in a non-calculator section, not so much of a drum for the calculator section, um, you can go pick whatever function you think is easiest to deal with, set it equal to x, and solve that value. And you'll get whatever the point of intersection is that exists on y equals x. It's a very safe bet. It's very unusual to have a point of intersection that is not on y equals x. By the way, it's only worth two marks, so you don't have to overdo it. Effectively, you got one mark for um, showing us that you understand that you need to set one of the equations equal to the other equation or equal to x. Um, you can see I've done some working out here. Um, I err on the side of putting a bit more working out than maybe um, the mark is going to give marks for. Um, just just a little bit more, just so that you can guarantee that you're going to get those full marks. Um, but effectively, at some point, whether it's here or here, you're going to use the sole function on your calculator in order to get the value that we're looking for, in this case, 3.618, or root 5 plus 5 on 2. And then, effectively, you did need to get make sure that your point of intersection had the x and the y value the same, assuming your, you know, your point was on the um, y equals x line. So note that I only worked out x. I didn't then substitute it in to work out what y is because I knew it was going to be on um, the y equals x line. So that means the x and the y coordinate would be the same. So one mark there and one mark there. You would have lost half a mark, I think, if you had these two values different for whatever reason. Okay, that's it. Any further questions you have on the uh, calculator section, please don't hesitate to find me and ask me or just ask your teacher and they'll be able to figure it out for you.